All right, come on. To have Matt look at my thing because I think I got all kinds of no ways. Yeah, I got all kinds of noise on it. That maybe took care of it. All right, so I think we got the microphone fixed now. So today we want to talk about the three purposes or the three uses of the law. I'm going to pull myself out of the way. I'm blocking the way for people. I'm to point the way, not to block the way. All right, here we go. All right. So, curb, mirror, guide. You understand all those? We just go on, right? Uh-huh. Okay. So first... The law helps to control violent outbursts of sin and keeps order in the world. It's a curb. Um, You know, you use the old drawing, you know, if the road is here. And by the way, this is a city thing and not necessarily a Florida city thing. And then at the edge of the roadway... There are curbs to keep the cars in. And so when you park, you know where to stop park, your parking. Um, another illustration I use, um, I like playing pool or billiards. And a billiard table looks pretty bad when I draw it. Cut it out. It's not cooperating with me. Stop it. Don't make me turn you off. You get the idea, okay? All right. So, got bumpers around it. What's the use of those bumpers? Well, we use them for ricochets, you're right. And you do bank shots where you, you hit the ball off here and hit there or whatever, and you got to figure out the angles and stuff. But on one particular shot, what, why, are you, why are you glad that there is a rail all the way around that table? So I'm on the break. So you got this triangle of balls down here. And you got a single ball right there. And the person's going to wind up with their their pool cue, and they're going to send that ball towards that triangle of pool balls very fast and very violently. And what happens to those balls that are in that rack? They They scatter. Now, if there's not these bumpers, in particular these bumpers, what what would happen? You don't want to be on that end of the table, right? Because when, once that ball hits, I mean, those balls can go anywhere. And so the, the bumpers, and by the way, true billiard doesn't have pockets. True billiards only have rails, and you play like three carom. What, right? Isn't it three, what, what do they call it? I don't know, but you, you have to bounce off three rails, and anyway. Is that snook, is that snook or snook? Anyway, but the rails perform two functions. One, it makes you make shots, but the one we want to talk about is it keeps the balls on the table. When we were in Missouri, we played some pool. My brother-in-law has a pool table that his dad had. 
and the great nephews are learning to play pool. Well, last year they weren't very good. But this year the, the oldest one had gotten quite good. And uh, my brother-in-law was telling me about a time that he got angry because he started hearing pool balls bouncing on the, the tile floor, ceramic tile. And he went in there and he said, okay, we're done. You're not playing anymore. And it wasn't really, the, he said, it wasn't really the kid's fault. They had no uh, adult supervision, and so they were hitting balls in the way that they weren't supposed to be hit, and they'd bounce over the rail, and they'd bounce on the floor. Well, what the, what, what, what's wrong with that? What? Several levels, which one is first? Well, start with the first. What? You can crack the tile. The, those, the pool balls are very hard, and they, when they bounce, they could crack the tile. What else could you do? He doesn't have geothermal heating under there, does he? Okay, yeah, that does. That is part of the new house. Um, so he's got he's got red heating tubes underneath there, and if they cracked the concrete, highly unlikely, they could break one of those red tubes that goes under there, and there'd be a waterfall. Um, I'm thinking more. You could break the pool ball. You could well, you not necessarily crack it, but if you put a uh, a divot in it. Then when you go to roll it, thump, 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 you know. Tear the felt. Yeah, and by the way, this is, what, when did your dad get that pool, pool table? Oh, yeah, just, just, just two or three years ago. So 50 years ago, her father bought that pool table. <laughs> wow, wow, 50 years, it's a 50-year-old table, and I don't believe it has been refelted. I think that's the original felt, and I mean, it is, it is as taut and as good as the day I think they made it. Of course, it's always kept covered, um, and only people that know what they're doing play on it, so it doesn't get torn up, but it still plays as well as the day that her dad bought it. But see, it's, it's those rails that keep those balls from going and, and causing mayhem. And by the way, there's other stuff setting around that room, and when the pool ball bounces, they bounce. And so when it bounces, what might it bounce into? A lamp, a picture, what? A kid might get hit in the head with a pool ball. Or the dog might get hit in the head with a pool ball. I thought you were talking kids. That was my preschool director talking about kids getting hit in the head with a pool ball. You got to worry about what what happens to these kids, right? You know. Anyway, so there's there's all kinds of bad things that happen. So that's my that's the the curb. The first use of the law is to prevent that. Now. I had to write a paper when I was in seminary on capital punishment, uh, pro or con, and I was con. Now, I am pro, pro capital punishment. I believe that it is within scripture, it is within God's law. But my argument was against capital punishment as it was at that time. This was in the 80s. And the whole thrust of the paper was that capital punishment is only an effective tool if it's two things if it's swift and if it's certain. It worked in the Old West because if you were uh, found guilty and the sentence was to be hanged by the neck, it was like the next day or the day after. At dawn, you'd be hung by the neck. Unless they wanted a spectacle of it, then it was at noon so everybody could come in from the farms and, and watch the hanging. Um, but it was effective because you knew there wasn't going to be any chance of reprieve, you were, if you were judged guilty, you were going to die. There still were outlaws, but they knew what the penalty was going to be. If someone is found guilty 
in a capital crime and the capital punishment sentence is given, how soon will they die? 20, 30 years because they have automatic appeals and so it's not, it's not swift. And then there are cases where, well, there was a, a man who was supposed to be put to death in Missouri and it was by lethal injection and some group found something wrong with one of the chemicals or, uh, or the company that produced the chemical wouldn't allow it to be used and so they didn't have the, the chemicals for the injection and so then they, they couldn't make sure that it was going to ha- it was going to work so they couldn't do it and it, so I mean he ended up sitting for years waiting for them to be able to kill him. Um, he knew he was dying he was going to die but so it, it, it wasn't effective. Punishment, prison punishment in particular, is only, uh, is only effective if it's something that they don't look forward to. And, uh, and so that, that we've lost that curve somewhat. Um, the curve has become, has become a Florida curve, curb. It's just kind of a a little slight rise, you know, on the edge of the road. When we were buying my new truck, I I just got a new truck this week. Um, And when we were buying it, the the guy doing the financing was talking about, and he said, now, you have a 16. He said, I thought you bought a 19 from here. I said, I did buy a 19. The 19 got totaled in November of 2000. Uh, 20. What? I said, yeah, I got totaled. I hit a tree. He said, you you left the road and hit a tree? I said, no, I hit a tree in the middle of the road. And he said, the tree fell in the road? I said, no, it's a tree in the middle of the road. And I pulled out my phone and I showed him. And and it's like, there's no guardrails around it. There's no nothing. It's just literally a tree in the middle of the road. I told him the tree moved overnight. I, 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 I swerved to miss that tree, and it moved into me. I swear it. Anyway, um, but see, there, there, there's no, nothing to guard around that. And it was a day that the sun was in a wrong angle, um, and it hit me in the eyes just as I came around the curve leading up to that tree, and I thought I followed the road to go around it, and I caught it right uh, on the driver's side. Jeff knows the tree I'm talking about. You're a better driver than me. You follow the curbs better. Um, but the, if, it, if, if you lose that curb, then this really doesn't prevent the violent outburst. Uh, some, uh, I, why do I bring that up? Because people have tried to lessen the impact of the Ten Commandments, you know, uh, and, well, it's not really a sin. It's not really that bad. It's not, you know, that's an old cultural norm. Um, I think you can go on the LCMS website uh, and you can get to the, the, Luther, the Lutheran Reporter. The Lutheran Reporter is a magazine that's mainly for the workers, but anybody can read it. And in the most recent Reporter, there was an article that Dr. Harrison, the president of the Synod, uh, encouraged us to read, and it had to do with the abolishment of Roe v. Wade and what, not, not what that does today, but the history of abortion and how we get into the fix we're in today. By the way, when, when do people start thinking that it's not a life, but it's just a, a part of the woman's body? When did that thinking come out? much earlier than that. Aristotle. Aristotle considered it a growth of the woman's body. It had no soul or spirit until a certain point in time. And so this is nothing new to say, well, it's, it's a part of the woman's body and therefore she ought to be able to choose. You know, scripture, we would say, scripture says that from conception that child is already known, 
You know, and scripture talked about Jeremiah, before you were born, I, I commissioned you. And it's kind of, wait a minute, I, if he doesn't exist, how can he be commissioned? You know, so, and, and the LCMS stance has always been that life begins at, at conception, and the, only in rare circumstances or exceptions is it acceptable, still not, not the, the right thing, you know, it's not commanded, but it is acceptable. Uh, rape, incest, uh, or the life of the mother being threatened. But see, if you can, if you can, all of a sudden go back to the Aristotelian view. And by the way, several schools grow out of that. And I encourage you to read that article. It's, it really is enlightening on how we get where we are today. Um, but you know, if you if you think of it as well, it's it's not a child until X point, and you move that X point, um, some will move it all the way to birth, or even after birth, um, and that's where they, they really uh, they really shot themselves in the foot by p- keep pushing it later and later, um, and uh, so the, the, the whole argument, but go out on lcms.org, and I believe you can get to the Lutheran Reporter on there and just look for the, the article on Roe v. Wade from this month's uh, reporter and read it. Um, it's a, I'll try and find a, it, find a PDF of it and I'll have Karen send it out if, if I can. Because um, I, I was reading the paper copy. I still read paper copies of some things. Yes, yeah, it's sitting on the counter. Yeah. Um, and you'll know you're in the right issue if the lead article is about 20,000 youth attend the youth gathering in Houston, which was just in July. So, uh, but if you see that, then look for the article. Uh, and I think it was Herman Sasse that wrote uh, a lot of the article. Well, he wrote uh, a lot of the thoughts in the article. Um, but you see, we've softened it, and all of a sudden, well, it's not, it's not wrong, it's not murder, it's, it's okay, you can, you can do whatever you want. It's on the first page, you, you did find it. Okay, scroll down, you can just go to LCMS, or Lutheran Reporter, and just scroll down, you can read the article. It is very enlightening, and I, I mean, I studied Plato and Aristotle and stuff like that, and I never really, I know the duality of uh, souls and, and body and stuff like that, but um, anyway, so the curb, the curb is only effective if it's, if it's a sharp break, and our governments today have turned away from uh, the law being a curb that defines this is where you live, not out here. And this would be considered the criminal world. This is the civil world. Um, and much like bad things happening when the balls leave the table, bad things happen when people leave those lines. Um, more recently, uh, we've had a lot of stories, and I don't want to get into the whole political situation today, but um, people on my, minor crime being... Uh, release, no bail releases, and all of a sudden, you know, they're, re, they're reoffending because there's no punishment, you know, and um, so, you know, we, we need to keep that curb in place. Now, do we need that curb in our life? Well, it still remains there. Do we need to think about the curb? I don't think about the bumpers when I'm playing pool unless I want to bank a shot. I think about the balls. And I don't think about the curb effect because my, my existence tends to stay in here. Now, at times, I will bump against them and I'll get a reminder that it's there. But what? Yeah. <laughs> Like when you hit the tree. What? Tree, you know what? My brother-in-law said, is the tree still standing? I said, yeah, it wasn't even hurt. 
I mean, kind of like, And I'm not the first or the last one to hit it, I'm sure. Yeah, the Chevy bow tie on it. Um, but it, it does remain. We don't, I don't preach the curb to Christians, even though it's there in the background. It, because I would expect Christians not to be involved in those violent outbursts of sins. Um, although we daily sin much and indeed deserve nothing but God's wrath. The second and third are where I spend more time. Um, how, many, how many of you think, oh wait a minute, 1 Timothy, we also know that law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers. Why Paul throws that one in, I don't know. You know who, why he picks up particularly on kills their father and mother, other than it's it's two, it's two commandments in one. Yes. Well, but I'm, I'm thinking historically, you know, where would Paul be pointing this? Other than, you know, by the way, read the history of the Caesars. And, and read the history of Herod. Who, if you were a relative of Herod, did you live happy and comfortable? No, you lived on, on pins and needles, especially if you were in the line of succession. Because he, he didn't want any threats. And so he would, he would wipe them out. That may be where he's going, but why Paul does that for Timothy, I don't know. I just haven't, I've never figured that one out. And I focus more here. The law is made for the unrighteous, the lawbreakers and the rebels. Without the law, where would we be? Not necessarily the lawbreakers, if the law is not there. But if we didn't know the law... Um, Say I'm out in Montana. By the way, Montana has no speed limit on open road. Think about it. Okay, I'm going to go to Germany. Better example. On the Autobahn, what's the speed limit? Uh-uh. It can be whatever the authorities choose in certain regions. Otherwise, there is no speed limit. And I know that because my friend, who was driving around Germany with Shelly and I, Shelly and I went to Germany with he and his wife, and we were driving in southern Germany, and all of a sudden he said, oh, I just got a ticket. And he had seen the flash on the side of the road that took the picture. And certain areas you'll go in, and they'll drop it to 100 kilometers per hour, 60 miles an hour. And, um, and he hadn't seen the sign and he hadn't slowed down to 100 and so they got him with a ticket. He didn't, he didn't see the sign, he didn't know. And so he was breaking the law without knowing it. And in the end, he got the reminder when the paper came, you must pay this in your fine and then he had to send the money to Germany to pay his fine. Um, same thing if you were in Montana and all of a sudden crossed over to North Dakota, North Dakota boundary, Montana, yeah. Wyoming, go over to Wyoming. No, Wyoming's even o more open. I'm going to one that has some speed limits. Montana. I I'm, trying to, I'm trying to picture the map in my mind. We have teachers in here. I, okay, Idaho, they have, they have speed limits in Idaho. So you cross into Idaho, that little strip of land, and you're, you're doing your 135 miles an hour in your Corvette Z06, 
and all of a sudden state troopers behind you in his his Ferrari pulling you over because he's got to stop all these people coming out of Montana that are that that are doing an ungodly speed and so he's got to have a fast car to pull him over and he pulls you over and says do you don't you realize that the speed limit is 65 miles an hour no I didn't realize that so he says okay well go on your way but remember the speed limit is 65 right no <laughs> license and registration and a major credit card I, no, I don't, I don't know that they say that last. I, I shouldn't have put that in there. But license and registration. I know that in Michigan, they don't look kindly upon speeders, especially in Paw Paw. Ask me how I know. What? There is a story there, and Eric's probably familiar with the story. Coming back from Christmas break, just cruising along, listening to the tunes. I'd put my my uh, cassette deck in, and I'm just cruising along. 1970 Plymouth Fury, 318 V8, and we're no. This was a this was an automatic. My dad liked automatics, and we're just cruising along until I saw that little red bubble light up on top of that car. Blue, a dark blue car with a red bubble on it. Oh! And I, I saw him, and I started pulling over onto the shoulder, and my friend said, what's wrong? I said, I'm about to get a ticket. And she said, why? How fast were you going? I said, 93. In a 55. So he pulls up behind me, and, and he asked me, uh, for my license and registration and he said do you know how fast we're going I said well when I looked down it was in excess of 90 he said well that's the second time I clocked you I said what he said I clocked you and I lost you I, well we got off to get McDonald's <laughs> got back on and didn't even think about it and I wasn't purposely going that fast we were just listening to tunes and cruising along you know, and it kind of like, oh yeah, this is fun. Until the that one cost me greatly. He did he did knock it down to 64 because he said if he rode it for 10 miles or more over, I had to spend the night in jail and see the magistrate the next day. So he said, I'm going to mark it down at 64, and you'll pay this ticket. And it still was it still was costly. Yeah. Don't speed on Michigan roadways. Oh, funny, the funny part, so then I, I said to my friend that I was taking her over to Detroit to her brother's house. I said to my friend, I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to cut off here at Kalamazoo, go up to Grand Rapids and pick up a friend of mine so that he can drive back. Oh, by the way, in, in Michigan, when you get a ticket, they take your license. You cannot drive on a ticket in Michigan. So I said, if you don't mind, we're going to go by, pick up my friend so that he can drive back from Detroit. Cause I was coming back that night to stay at my friend's house. And so she said, no, that's fine. So we pulled up there, and I got to talking to by my friend's father and mother, and finally he showed up and hopped in the car, and away we go. We're coming home. This is like midnight. And Carl said, what was that? I said, what, what do you mean? He said, I saw something out my side window. All of a sudden, behind us, the red light comes on. I said, how fast were you going? He said, I, I might have been doing 60. So we pulled over, and the policeman said, do you know how fast you were going? And Carl said, I'd, maybe 60? The guy said, yeah, I clocked you at 60. He said, can I see your license? And Carl handed him his license, and the policeman looked at it and said, well, I'm going to, you do know the speed limit is 55. I'm going to give you a, a, an economy ticket. That was in the gas gas shortages. I'm going to give you a, a, an economy ticket. And, uh, but they, were, they, they saw the car and they thought they'd got me. Poor Carl got a ticket because of it. Anyway, but 
if you don't know the law, you might break the law without knowing it. And so that's why it's important that we understand what the Ten Commandments are. Um, it's why we teach it in all of our classes. When Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciousness also bearing witness, their thoughts now accusing, now defending them. That's a, I know I put it kind of short, I wanted that all in one. We were talking about this on Thursday at Bible study, talking about authority, and, and before, prior to Moses, was there... Was there law? Yes. Otherwise, why does God condemn the world? Because every thought of every man's heart was only evil all the time. If there's no law, there's no evil. Right? Why was it wrong when Cain killed Abel? If there's no law. You see, the law is already there. And when Eve eats of the tree, all of a sudden they recognize right and wrong, even though it's not written down. It's a moral law, moral conscience. And so the requirements are already there. They're written on their hearts. You can call it their conscience. Uh, but there's a moral law inside. Um, if mom or dad didn't tell you that you shouldn't eat a cookie before dinner, would you know that it was wrong? No. I eat all the cookies I want before dinner. You know it's wrong. You're supposed to eat your dinner, right? If I'm, if I'm going faster than everybody on the road, I know I'm probably breaking the law. You know? And, and so the, the law is already there but we teach specifically the ten points of the law that God gives to us. Secondly, the law is a mirror. It shows us our sin. Um, why do we need the law in that light? Why do we need it to show us our sin? So I've told this story before, but we have some people that haven't been here before. So when I was in seminary, we had to take an evangelism course. And it was called Dialogue Evangelism. And in that class, um, we had to go out on a weekend and we had to knock on doors and do dialogue evangelism with people. In preparation for that, the church that hosted the, the seminar for the students provided teachers or mentors that would take two out and would teach them to do the, you know, go through the dialogue with them. So I was teamed up with another guy who eventually became a pastor. And we went to the McDonald's parking lot, and so we're sitting there. She's in the front seat, and he and I are in the back seat. And she says, okay, you go first to my friend. And he starts in on it, and he starts in on the dialogue. The dialogue is about sin, uh, sin, save your salvation. And uh, so he starts in on how sin is a bad thing, and, and he knew he was a sinner, and that because of his sin he was lost, and he needed salvation. See, there's the, you jump over the bridge. He needed salvation, but he was powerless to help himself until he realized that God had provided a Savior. I'm shortening the dialogue by a lot, by the way. He needed a Savior in, in Jesus, and that because of what Jesus had done, he already knows that he is saved, even though he sinned. And uh, how, what, he, he went through it very quickly, and he said, so, so what do you think about that? And I said, well, I'm glad you found something that works for you. <laughs> the gal in the front looked, <laughs> and what? And my friend looked at me and said, well, don't, don't you want a, a Savior? It's like, well, you need one. I'm glad you found one. I've never robbed any banks. I've never shot anybody or killed anybody. I've never stolen somebody's wife. I pretty well do what my mom and dad asked me to do. I'm good. And the, the mentor in the front seat chuckled and said, yeah, you were pretty weak on that first point. 
And he realized then that he had talked about how sin had impacted him. But he hadn't talked about how sin had impacted me. See, if I don't, if, if, if I see the murderers and the bank robbers and the rapists and the whoever's out there and how terrible they are, how, hang them all! And I'm, I'm constantly looking at that. It's kind of like, I'm not one of them. I'm not one of them. I think I'm pretty good. Do I need a savior? No. I'm good. I think I'm good because I haven't been convicted of that sin. The second use of the law, it becomes a mirror that shows us every place we have fallen short of God's law. And by the way, Jesus says, if you keep the law perfectly but fail in one jot, by the way, one jot would be one iota. And it's that little spot over the iota. That's it. That little spot. Keep the, the whole law but fail in that spot. And you're guilty of the whole law. See, if we don't understand that, the cross is for vain. We don't need that cross. We're good. Right? But when we look into the mirror of our sin, or the mirror of the law, and we understand we have failed, you know, the, the old confession from uh, TLH. Look it up sometime. I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sin and iniquity with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. Right? What, what makes you feel pretty good about that statement? Nothing. It's kind of the, the Rodney Dangerfield statement. <laughs> you know? But... I can't do that because of my microphone. Um, yeah, Rodney Danger. He was he was funny. Uh, used to love him on Johnny Carson. But <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but see, if we don't if we if we don't say that statement, do we go on with the neck? But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you because of your boundless mercy. Do we get to that point if we don't realize that we are that poor, miserable sinner who indeed deserves nothing but God's wrath? If we don't look at the mirror of the law, we think we're okay. You know, I'm glad you have Jesus. I'm glad that you believe Jesus saved you from your sin. But I'm okay. I don't need that. And by the way, I on some of the forums that I'm on that I read, we'll have religious discussions, and invariably somebody will kick in with that. Well, I'm glad it works for you, but I don't need that. It is. They, yeah, they think they, they are morally sound in their moral code, and therefore... They treat one another, kind of the golden rule, do unto others as you have them do unto you, right? Um, but, but if they have an opportunity to get away with something, they'll get away with something. You know, not, not, no, I mean, you know, so, so one of them's a, 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 a firearm forum, a collector forum for Colts and uh, Rugers and Smith and Wessons. And, and so, you know, it's kind of like, you know, oh, yeah, I, I had this, this gun and a, a Guy walked up to the table at the show and he said, Oh, I love that gun. I'll give you $1,500 for it. And the, well, well, take it? Yeah. Well, you know that gun's only worth $800. Yeah, but he offered me $15. I took it. Is there anything wrong with that? The guy didn't say, I want $1,500 for the gun. So he's okay the other guy offered it, right? I'd be a fool not to accept it. 
Oh, oh, by the way, that discussion went downhill very fast. Very fast about how that, that harms the uh, reputation of uh, cult collectors and how we need, we need to be true to what we know. And we know the value and we don't, we don't rip people off and, you know, and things like that. And I mean, it, there was not too many people that said, yeah, you're fine. But see, in his eyes... He didn't, set the, he didn't set the limit. The guy offered it. And so he was okay with that. You know, never mind that probably he should have said, well, I'm glad you offered that, but you know, really it's only worth about $800. How about $800? You know, uh, But when you set your own moral code, you, it, it's kind of hard. It's kind of like if I dropped you in the middle of the ocean, you had plenty of gas in your boat. You're in a boat, by the way. <laughs> you're, in, in, you're in a rather large boat. I mean, it, it's not a, a plush yacht or anything, but it is a rather large boat. It's fit for the ocean, and you have plenty of gas to get where you need to go. But I don't tell you which way to go. How do you determine which way to go? Okay, so the sun will tell you where east or west is. Did I drop you in the Pacific or did I drop you in the Atlantic? Or did I drop you in Antarctic? You don't know. See, if you don't know, it's hard to, to plot a course, right? You got to know where you're starting and where you want to go to. When you set your own moral code, you don't know where you are. You don't know where you... You're starting. You don't know where you're going. That's why we need that mirror. If we look at the law and we say, first commandment, oops, broke that one. Second, com second commandment, uh, oops, broke that one. Uh, third commandment, oops, yeah, broke that one. Fourth commandment, uh, yeah, oh, yep, I broke that one. Fifth commandment, well, I, I don't, I, yep, broke that one. You know, and I mean, you're checking them off. And it's kind of like, okay, I, you got me, Lord. Um, and when we, when we look at that, it's kind of like, is there anyone good? No, none, not even one. And that's what the mirror shows us. And Jesus was the perfect one. But he wants to turn the attention to the one who loves. See, it's only in looking to God and his gift of Jesus. Um, yeah. Right. So the old, yeah, Sammy's making the point, the Old Testament characters who lived kind of lawful lives, they tried to follow the law, they tried to keep what God uh, proclaimed as law, and most of them, at, most of them post uh, Ten Commandments. Um, but they're declared righteous not because they kept the law, but because they kept the, the promise. You see, the mirror shows you the law, it shows you your sin, and it brings forth that desire for the Savior. You know, without that, we're, we're going to think we're okay. You know, um, I read a story, and um, I, read, I read a lot of books, but in this story, the guy had been traveling by horse. I, it, was, it was a Western. He was traveling by horse, and he came to this, house in the middle of nowhere and he was going to pull up to the well and, and, and get a drink for his horse and for himself and so the guy comes out and says yeah well why don't you come in and join us we're having bacon and beans and my wife picked some biscuits no no I, no, I'm not hungry I just need a, a drink for my horse and I and about that time the wife walks out with a plate full of bacon and beans by the way that's a staple of every western but you know bacon and beans um and comes out with that plate of bacon and beans with a biscuit sitting on top of it. 
and says, here, why don't you, why don't you eat this before you go? And, and the character says, and I remember this, this, I read this a while back, but the character said, I didn't realize how hungry I was until I smelled that food. Because you know, he'd been on the road for so long, he, did, he felt the thirst, but he didn't feel the hunger until something brought it out. We can think we're fine, but once that mirror shows who we really are, and by the way, it's got to be the true mirror, not the funhouse mirror. Y'all remember those funhouse mirrors that could make you look 10 feet tall or 3 feet tall, make you look 5 feet wide or 6 inches wide? I always like that one. Oh, look how thin I am. I'm not overweight. I'm under tall. Um, <laughs> anyway, we need that law to show us who we really are. Um, and and I, I, how many of you guys look in the mirror when you're shaving in the morning? How many of you shave in the morning? <laughs> of course we look in the mirror when we're shaving, right? I would hope so. Um, I always tell people that I have to answer the person I look in the eye while I'm shaving. You know, um, how many of you women, when you're putting your makeup on, just stand in the middle of a room, put your makeup on, and don't look in a mirror? <laughs> Yesterday's portals of prayer. If you want to know God's there, look in the mirror in the morning and feel your hand, feel the breath. Dan. It's Vic Belton. Vic Belton, I love listen. I could sit and listen to Vic Belton every day. Vic, if you're listening, I don't want to do that, by the way. But I could. And um, that sermon that I quoted, that line that I quoted out of the sermon, was Vic, Vic Belton, by the way. You know, if anything gets in the way of the cross, it's got to go. And his point was, all this fighting, all this bickering over things that aren't in the Bible, we got to stop that. And we got to get back to... Jesus Christ and him crucified. Um, but yeah, Vic Belton is, is good. I, I probably have to read the devotions this month just because Vic did them. He's now first vice president of the Florida Georgia District, by the way. Was devoted to that. Um, so we got two Bible verses, and I'm, then I'm going to stop, and we'll go into the third use of the law. I'll, I'll kind of... I want you to look this week at your life and see when the, the law becomes that. So Romans 3.20, through the law we become conscious of sin. Without the law we wouldn't know. Uh, and Romans 7.7, 7, I would not have known what coveting was if, it, if the law had not said do not covet. And by the way, that's probably the most subtle of the commandments, the 9th and 10th or the 10th commandment, depending on which version you're looking at, do not covet. Uh, but if we don't have that, we don't think about the fact that our, our desires can be evil as well. So, I'm going to just put this up. I want you to think about how the law teaches us that we should, what we should not, should and should not do to lead a God-pleasing life. It, it serves as a, gu a guide. So I want you to, this week, kind of take note of how that law is functioning in your life and how it helps you to lead a better life. So think about the Ten Commandments. You might even put the ten numbers one to ten on a piece of paper and put a check mark by them when that commandment came into your thoughts during this week. I'm not going to collect the papers, by the way. Um, but how, how does the Ten Commandments, how do the Ten Commandments, uh, how does that lead us in the way we ought to live? How does it serve as a guide? I'll probably have Jeff come up here and draw a straight line without a ruler. Here, I'll draw a straight line. That's the only way I could do it, is if it's already there. Um, but think about that this week. We'll continue next week. We'll finish up with the purposes of the law. And then um, 
we'll talk about, we'll begin talking about sin. You know, what, kind, what other kinds of sin? And by the way, there's, there's four. Four categories. I'm not going into it right now. We'll get into that next week. And by the way, you probably, probably get caught on one of them more than the other. Now you're going to sit and go, what's he talking about? <laughs> Come back next week and find out. So let's close with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give, we give you thanks that you have given to us your law. No, we cannot keep it perfectly. Yes, we daily sin much and indeed deserve nothing but your wrath. And yet through your law, you teach us how to live as better people among the rest of your people. Bless us, Heavenly Father, with your mercy and love. Set our feet upon that path, and may your word be a light unto that path. Teach us and guide us always by your Ten Commandments to live by the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here, and we will continue with point C next time. All right. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'll try it. Actually, I, that could come in useful. That's true. That's true. Well, <laughs> if I drove like that, I wouldn't have hit the tree. Well, yeah, and I do find that. It may take practice. I, I do find that. My eyes constantly, you, you, you identify, that car could come out, that kid yeah, could run yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, yeah, I'm yeah, constantly yeah, balanced. My father-in-law, he was, he was told he couldn't drive. The guy said, you can't switch between tasks. My father-in-law says, hey, what does that have to do with anything? I said, Dad, if you can't switch between looking at that kid on the, yeah. the sidewalk and is he going to run across and that car, is it going to pull out? You can't switch your mind between those things. You shouldn't be driving. Yeah. Well, I can. I said, well, then you have no problem. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. You, you're always looking. You're looking down the road, not 